chapter 15. As we continue with our month of prayer, let's, um, let's read this together. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they would also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father, but the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me, and you will also bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering a service to God, and they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things to you that when the, their hour comes, you may remember what I have told you. Let's pray together. Father, as we look at this passage of Scripture, as we um, think about this time before the crucifixion that Jesus is communicating his, to his disciples the things which are of utmost importance, we recognize that those words were given to them, but they're also given to us. And so may you impress them upon our hearts today. As we think about prayer this month and what it means and how practically that works in our lives, I pray that you would take these words this morning and that you would communicate through them to us. That as your Holy Spirit is working in us, as we recognize that you are present among us today, walking the aisles, sitting in the pews, may we be mindful of what it is that you are communicating to us today as we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So Jesus, um, on the night he was betrayed, He's in the upper room, and he's communicating to his disciples, and we've been looking at that over the last few weeks, and understand that Jesus has said some things to his disciples. He said to the one who believes in me, they will do the works that I do. In fact, they will do even greater works than I do, and we see in the scriptures the fulfillment of that as the disciples begin to do the works of Jesus. They begin to do the miracles. They're doing some of the things that Jesus is doing. But more importantly, he says, there are greater things that you will do. And what he meant by that, I believe, is that he's saying the Christ that you are going to direct people to is even different than the Christ that I am directing them to. He's, he's saying that the Christ you will direct them to is a risen Christ. He, he's a Christ that has paid the price for our forgiveness, paid the price for our sin. And, and so the, the greater things that you're going to be doing is that you're going to show people the risen Christ. And their lives are going to be forever changed as they believe in the things that I have shown you, commanded you to do. He promises them the Holy Spirit who will, who will teach them and who will direct them. He, he says to them, you will be known by your love for one another. He tells them that, that it will demonstrate that, that they have love for God by the fact that they are obeying the commandments that, that he's given to them. Last week we talked about the, the fruit that the followers of Christ would bear, demonstrating that their lives would be changed, demonstrating that people will come to Christ. He says that your prayers will be answered. And he says God would be glorified. This week in this passage of Scripture, as we look at it, we understand that Jesus is communicating 
he's continuing this conversation that he has with his disciples and he's communicating these things that the world is going to hate you on account of me because the world hated him. He says you're going to be persecuted. He says the, the way of Jesus is not an easy one. He tells them that the Holy Spirit will, will show people the truth about Jesus through their lives. And he also says to them, you will bear witness. You will testify to the truth. You will show people and tell people the truth about Jesus Christ. Next week, I want to talk about the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. But this week, I want to talk about the connection between prayer and evangelism as we wrap up this month of prayer that we've been um, working through together. When Jesus looks into the future and predicted what would happen to his disciples and talks about it here, talks about in other passages of Scripture in John 15 and 16 here, he says that the people will persecute you. They will put you out of the synagogues. People will kill you, and they will think that they are doing God a service. He, he says, there is a time that's coming where you will bear witness, where you will testify, where you will tell people about Jesus Christ. In a parallel passage in, in Luke, he says that they will persecute you. He, he says that they will imprison you. He says that they will bring you before kings because of Christ. And he says that this will be a time where you will bear testimony, where you will have an opportunity to share your faith, where you will have an opportunity to take the gospel that's been planted in you and share it with others. It, this is a, a sobering passage, and yet it's also an encouraging passage. It's sobering because there is the fact here that that even though the cause of Christ will eventually win in the end, and, and we know that it does, amen? amen? He's in control. He's alive. But even though those things are going to happen in the future, Jesus is saying, you know, from this conversation on, you should expect that you will be persecuted. You should expect that because you're living your faith in front of people that you will be imprisoned. And because of that, you're going to be put in front of some pretty important people because of your faith. You're going to be arrested. You're going to be persecuted. The encouraging things that we find in this passage of Scripture is that God intends for these persecutions and for these imprisonments and even for these deaths to bring glory to God as an opportunity to witness for him. And as you read through the book of Acts, you see just this kind of thing happening. You see that the disciples are preaching about Jesus. They're testifying. They're bearing witness to the truth of Jesus. And what happens to them? They're imprisoned. They're persecuted. In Acts chapter 7, we begin to see that they're even killed because of their faith. They're kicked out of the synagogues. But we see people, even in the midst of those things, having incredible opportunities to share their faith in Jesus Christ with the world. So sharing your faith, living the way of Jesus, may lead you to be hated. It may lead you to be persecuted. It may lead you to be in prison. It maybe even will lead to death. We see that in our world today. But in the midst of that, Jesus says the gospel is shared. God gives his followers, the followers of Jesus, incredible opportunities in some incredibly difficult situations to take the incredibly powerful gospel and share it with the world. An example of this is in Acts chapter 26. If you want to turn there, keep your finger in John 15 because we're coming back there. But in Acts chapter 26, we see that Paul is arrested. We, we begin to see these things lived out in the lives of the disciples. We see the persecution of, of Peter and John. We're introduced to the persecution of Paul, and we see here that Paul has been arrested. He now stands before the king. I mean, what, a, what an incredible opportunity that he has and he wouldn't have if he wasn't so bold in his faith. 
He has this audience. He's already been through some incredibly difficult things to get to this place, but he is alive, and God is using him mightily to spread the gospel to the Gentiles. In Acts chapter 26, Paul is telling King Agrippa about his conversion and his call to ministry. It's an incredible testimony, and he's sharing it with the king. He reports the spectacular encounter that he has with Christ on the Damascus Road. He, he reports to him the commission that Christ has given to him to do the work that he has called him to do and share the gospel with the Gentiles. It's the words of commission, and they're so amazing and, and relevant, I think, today to us and our concern for evangelism. Look at verse 15 there where Paul says, I, or he's, he's, he's really he's quoting Jesus. Maybe it's read in your Bible. He says, I am Jesus who you are persecuting as he's recounting the, the encounter he has with him on the road to Damascus. But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles whom I am sending you. Now listen to what Jesus says as he's sending Paul to do this gospel ministry. Verse 18. He says, I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light. They may turn from the power of Satan to God. And they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, it says that people who are spiritually blind, they're spiritually blind until God opens their eyes, 2 Corinthians 4. God causes them to see. God causes them to be born again. So as we engage in evangelism, prayer has to be so foundational to that. Prayer has to be so fundamental to that because we recognize that on our own we can't do those things. We can't open the eyes of the blind we, we can't save anyone. We can't take anyone from, from death to life. We can't take anyone from darkness to light. We can't take anyone from the power of Satan to the power of God. Only God can do that, and so we pray. I mean, have you ever shared your faith, with, with Je- um, shared your faith about Jesus, your faith in Jesus with, with someone, and, and you've, what you believe is a good argument? You've given that to them, and there's nothing there. And then a little later on, you're sharing the exact same story with them, and you understand that the light has come on. And they're understanding what you're saying, and they're hearing what you're saying, and it's making sense to them. Well, that's, that's the Holy Spirit at work. Only God can do that. But in the book of Acts, Jesus says to Paul, I'm sending you to open their eyes. So what's going on there? What, what does he mean by that? Only God can open the eyes. Only God can save a life. What's going on there? I want to say that God opens the eyes of the blind to see the truth and the beauty and the worth of Christ. But he does it by sending people like you and me to tell them out of love and obedience about Jesus. He turns the light on, he opens the eyes, but he uses people to do it. And so there's a message to believe when their eyes are opened as it's been communicated to them, as you take your faith and you share that with them and and you tell them about the gospel of Jesus. You tell them that he, is, that he has come. And very simply, he has died. And he's taken our sin upon himself. And, and he died on the cross. And he was buried. And he, and he rose again from the dead. And he's, he's coming back. This is the main elements of the gospel. You tell them that. And God opens their eyes. And they have a message to believe. They have a message to understand. Have you ever stopped to think, however, 
as we think about Paul, and maybe you know a bit about his life, if you don't, I'd challenge you to read through the book of Acts and hear some of the stories that he went through, some of the persecution that, that was upon him and the, the, the unbelievable opportunities he had to share his faith. But if you ever stop to think how much Paul's witness to Christ was given in circumstances that, that he didn't plan, you ever thought about that? Try to relate that to your life. I'm not down on planning. I'm a planner. I, I try to think through things before we move ahead. I think that's essential. I think Paul did that. I think Paul has a very clear plan, a very clear directive of what he's supposed to do. Paul's got a very clear plan for evangelism in his life as we look at that. It's obvious from the book of Acts, but the point I'm making is that God is the master planner. The Bible tells us that man plans his ways, but God directs his steps. What God wants is people who are ready and people who are willing to move with the gospel. It says in the book of Ephesians in chapter 6, as we're, as we're talking about the, the spiritual warfare, as we're talking about the armor of God, he, he says, put on the, the shoes of readiness for the gospel of peace. Are you ready to share the gospel with people? Paul was. Paul was prepared, and so God puts him in so many different situations that he didn't plan on. And once we're moving in plans for evangelism, I guarantee you there's going to be many interruptions, many distractions, many surprises, but none of them are without a purpose. Again, this is why prayer is so important. Not only do we need to be dependent on God for the words to say and for the courage to say them, and be in prayer for the listener that God would open their eyes and God would work in their hearts and, and that God through obedience, our obedience, would do a miracle in that person's life, bringing them from darkness to light, opening their eyes, bringing them from the power of Satan to the power of God. But also we need to pray that God would, would, would allow us to be open to his interruptions in our plans so that his plans would be accomplished. Is prayer important for evangelism? It is essential for evangelism. Back to John 15. Jesus says, you will bear witness because you've been with me from the beginning. Chapter 16 has said, I've said all these things to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when Whoever kills you will think they have done a service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things to you that their hour, when their hour comes, you will remember that I told them to you. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. In other words, in every circumstance, especially the unexpected ones, and the frustrating ones. We need to be ready to bear witness to Christ, ready to tell people about the gospel of Jesus. I mean, it wasn't Paul's plan to be here. Two years earlier, he had been arrested on false charges in Jerusalem, and at the time, he, he got to give his testimony to the entire Jewish Sanhedrin, the entire ruling council of the Jews. And there's Paul giving his testimony with boldness, with, with courage, because he's ready. At the time he got to give his testimony, like Jesus said he would, they, he said they will arrest you and there will be a time for testimony. And then there was a plot against his life, so, so Paul moves to Caesarea some distance away on the coast. And, and this time, he gets to give a testimony to Felix, the governor. 
And after two years in a Caesarean prison, the Roman governor Festus puts Paul before King Agrippa. And then Paul has an opportunity to tell him what's on his mind, to tell him the gospel of Christ. So the whole Jewish council, the three highest political officials in the country all hear the gospel because Paul is arrested and he's imprisoned and he's brought on, up on false charges. All of that because he was in prison. All of that that he wouldn't have had an opportunity to do, most likely, without being in prison, without being persecuted. Surely the lesson we should learn from the words of Jesus in John 15 and 16 and, and also in Luke and from the way they were fulfilled in the life of Paul is that God has a plan for us. And the setbacks and all the frustrating things in our lives, God still has a plan. God still desires for us to share the gospel. I mean, let's be honest. Some of you are here today and you didn't expect that you would be here today. I'm talking long term. For those of you who are younger, maybe you couldn't wait to get out of Chatham. Maybe you still can't wait to get out of Chatham. Maybe there's just some things in your life that you said, I don't want to be here anymore. I want to go someplace else. But could you admit this morning that God has you here at this time in this place for a reason? Maybe it wasn't what you planned. Maybe this is a setback for you. But God has a plan. If you're a follower of Jesus this morning, I guarantee you that plan involves evangelism. That plan involves sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. You mean, there may, there may be several other reasons why you're here, but I know that that is one of the reasons why you are here. Your plans have been changed, but God has a plan. For those of you who are older, maybe you didn't think that you would be in Chatham this long. or This isn't a place where you thought, you know, five years ago you would be. You know, have your plans ever changed? Sure. All of our plans have been changed at one point or another. Have you ever thought that, that it might be because God is going to use you to bear witness for him here in this place? And that, that's, a, that's a game changer for me. I mean, there is a perspective there that excites me and it helps me to realize that maybe all of the stuff that we go through in our lives that we don't necessarily know why, we don't necessarily see that there's a plan, that there's a purpose, it's because God has a plan and a purpose. He has you here in this place at this time for such a time as this. To live your lives in front of people and the unexpected times and the unexpected ways and the unexpected things of our lives Maybe they're a way of saying, are you ready to share the gospel? Because I want you to do it here. There's a person across the road from where you live, and you need to make an effort to share the gospel there. There's a person in, in the, at the desk next to where you work, and you might not know why you're in that office. Maybe you had other plans in your lives, but that person needs to hear about Jesus. Have you ever looked at it that way? Are any of you in the midst of a two-year setback like Paul was? Anybody here on a detour that you had not planned about? I mean, don't worry about it as if God had no purpose in it. Trust his wisdom to allow what has happened to happen and put on those shoes of readiness for the gospel of peace so that you might share the gospel on the detour. 
Don't take off the shoes of readiness thinking that detours don't have any purpose for the gospel. Jesus said there will be a time for testimony. I see so much encouragement here for living lives of expectation that God is going to do something. That God is going to use us for something. You get up in the morning and you pray and maybe you make your plans and, and you're thinking, okay, these are the things that I have to do today. This is the, this is the schedule that I have. God, help me to, to, to do that. Help me to accomplish these things. Help me to persevere in the, in the tasks that you have for me to do. But maybe at the end of that prayer, we need to be praying something like this. Lord, I know that you are God and I am not. I'm not in control here. You are. And I don't know what lies ahead for me. I don't know what's going to happen on the way to work. I don't know what's going to happen on, at work. I don't know what's going to happen as I go to the gym or as I go to the school or whatever it is. I don't know. But God, you do. And I pray that I would be ready to share the gospel of peace in those unexpected, unplanned times of my life from my perspective. But God, I know you've had it planned from the beginning. I make plans, but you direct my steps. Would you govern my day so that all of its unplanned detours are made valuable for your purpose? You know, and this is key. Help me to see divine appointments and God moments where Satan wants me to see interruptions and distractions. Can we pray like that? So I hope you live your days with this sense of expectancy and readiness to move with the gospel. Paul is standing here before King Agrippa by God's divine appointment on a two-year detour from what he wanted to do. And now he stands before the king of Palestine and he probably recognizes, I never would have had this opportunity if I wasn't arrested. And Jesus says, the reason that things happen like this is for an opportunity to share your faith. So what does this mean for us today? By way of application, I mean, there is an element in our ministry in, at Emmanuel here in the city of Chatham that involves us specifically. I mean, we understand in our lives as we gather here together as a church that God is concerned about our spiritual growth, so we must be concerned about our spiritual growth, and we, we try to build into one another, we, we teach one another, we open our word, the word of God together. We need to be a people of prayer. Uh, I trust that you've got my heart on that this, this month. We need to be a people of the book. I trust that you get that every week as we open God's word together. We seek to on Sunday mornings, and my prayer is that you would do it every day as well. That your, your Bible would be well-worn because you've spent so much time in it that, that the physical structure of your Bible needs attention. Maybe it needs duct tape because you've worn it out, because you've given it much attention in your life and tried to apply it as the Holy Spirit works in you. I, I trust that you're building into one another's lives as iron sharpens iron. But our ministry in the city of Chatham must never be mainly a come and see ministry. It has to be a go and tell mission. Suppose that all 300 or so of you arrived on the scene of Chatham and we all got to Chatham together and, and we began to think of a plan for evangelism. We began to think of a plan for reaching this city as, as tent-making missionaries, as people who had other careers as as we're, as we're doing those things, as we're working, and, and then we're, we're recognizing that our need is to reach the, the city for the gospel of Christ, with the gospel of Christ. You know, there are people who will work at secular jobs to support themselves and families and that, that will try to penetrate a different uh, segment of the population with the gospel of Christ. Those are tent-making missionaries. 
And suppose that we all get together and said, well, here we are in Chatham and, and we are developing a plan for evangelism and, and we have no place to live and there's 300 of us and then there's children too. What should we do to reach the city for Christ? I think the answer would be, well, let's go out, let's go out and find jobs and, and all different kinds of jobs all over the city and let's join in some community clubs and some athletic clubs and, and get involved in some of the programs of our city and let's enroll our kids in, in the schools in the area. And let's pray and let's let the Spirit guide us to houses and to apartments all over the city because we don't want to live in one place. We don't want to have like this, this commune. We want to live in different parts of the city where we can have a witness and, and let's not make... Um, Christian industry that we all work at, but let's live and let's do different jobs and, and let's work all over the city and have this model where we're, we're penetrating different areas of the city and different groups of the population. We would say, you know, maybe that's a great idea. That's a great strategy for reaching the world. You're sitting here this morning and you're thinking, I know you're thinking, and it's encouraging because hasn't God already done that? You were a church of 400 tent-making witnesses to the gospel of Christ. Where we work, where we, where we live among the, the people of Chatham. And that's just where God wants us. The first thing that Christ aims to do with his witnesses is that he causes them to be a go and tell people that they are gathering together to strengthen one another and yet they go out and they share the gospel of Christ with the world. So one of my prayer requests for this year is that we would pray for further and for new opportunities for every Christ follower to serve our community and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray for wisdom as our people grow in knowing how to best expand into our city. The second thing that Christ is is trying to accomplish here in, in his gospel here as he's sharing with his disciples is to accomplish it in, in our witness that we are seeking to open the eyes of unbelievers to whom I send you to open their eyes. But we ask, how can we do that? How can I open the eyes of the blind? The answer, of course, is that we can't. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6 says, It's God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, and who has shone in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. It's God who said originally, Let there be light. And it's God who says to an unbeliever, Let there be light. And the light comes on, and their eyes are opened. And he moves them from darkness to light, and the power of Satan to the power of God. We can't do it. But I want to challenge us all this morning to say don't stop because you can't. Because he's called you to do it. Uh, of course we can't do it on our own. But the fact that you can't make electricity or the fact that you can't create light doesn't stop you from turning on a light switch. The fact that, that you can't create cell tissue never stops you from from eating your, your meals. So don't let the fact that you can't cause new birth, that you can't turn on the light in somebody's life, that you can't open their eyes, don't let that fact ever stop you from telling them the gospel. That's how people are born again. Through the living and abiding word, the good news of Christ. In Acts chapter 26, Christ says to Paul, I send you to open their eyes. That means that we Christians, through prayer and through obedience, are partners with the Holy Spirit in opening the eyes of the blind. We do two key things. We pray for God to open the eyes of the blind. That's the prayer part. And then we speak the words of the truth about Christ. That's the obedience part. So that when people's eyes are opened, there is something for them to believe. The Holy Spirit never opens the eyes of the heart until there is gospel truth in their mind to believe. See, that's how we partner with the Holy Spirit. 
He gives us the message to share. We're to be obedient in sharing it. And as we do that, he opens the eyes of the blind so that they can understand it. Our job in obedience is we put the truth of Christ into a person's mind with testimony. And in prayer, we trust God for the miracle of spiritual sight to the blind. And God in his time and in his way says, let there be light. Don't take on more than what is your human responsibility this morning. But far more urgent, don't take on less. Because God is calling you to do it. Man plans his ways. God directs his steps. He wants to do great and eternal things. God longs to do through us. He wants to do miracles. He wants to do these miracles in people's lives where he moves them from death to life, where he moves them from darkness to light, where he moves them from the power of Satan to the power of God. And all this through prayer and obedience, we partner with the Holy Spirit to bear witness of the truth that Jesus Christ is Lord now and forevermore. Let's pray. Father, we know this morning that evangelism is not optional. And prayer is not optional. And they go together. And so, Father, may we understand in our lives that we may make plans, we may determine all these things that we want to do in our day and and all these things that we want to do in our lives. But we're reminded again in Scripture that you direct our steps. So, Father, may we be ready to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with people. And may we see that where Satan wants us to see interruptions and distractions, may we begin to see these as God moments and divine appointments, that there is a purpose in everything that God desires for us to do. And may we have that communication with you. May we have that heart for you. May we have that understanding of you to be able to see those things in our lives every day that we would be people of prayer, that we would be people of the book, that we would be people of evangelism, willing and eager to give a reason for the hope that we have in whatever circumstance we find ourselves. So that ultimately, Father, you would be able to open the blind eyes of people and they would have a message to understand. They would have a message to hear and that they would come to a saving knowledge of Jesus. We pray this, <clears throat> this morning for the lost in our community and understand that we have a huge task ahead of us. We have a, a mission. And Father, we gather here and we strengthen one another and we teach one another and we, we talk about the things that you're doing in our lives and we, we sharpen one another as iron sharpens iron. We're supposed to be about those things. We're to be engaged in discipleship. But, Father, part of discipleship is evangelism. And so when we leave this place, may we understand that we need to go and we need to tell and we need to share the message of Jesus with the world. In whatever circumstance we find ourselves so that you are glorified and praised. In Jesus' name, amen.